Thank you, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all. There's a lot of you out there. I see you all just crash through the barriers at the back. Well done. Um, as usual with TCO, we do something we're not supposed to, and we do it very well. So um, it's, it's an interesting, it's been a really interesting day for me. Uh, looking back at the last 10 or 11 years, um, we st this project got started more than 10 years ago. Uh, for me, that was three jobs ago. Um, I don't know about you, but I was younger then. Um, I feel all 10 of those years. Um, but as we look back at this, it's hard not to get a little philosophical. Um, and as I think about what DCO has done in 10 years, you know, we can sort of see that there's a whole lot of new deep carbon science that this group has enabled and really sort of brought to life. And we're, we've seen it today. We're going to see it for the next two days. But I think DCO has also shown us a new way of doing science. And that new way is a much bigger way of doing science than I think a lot of us have been used to prior to this. Um, I think if we're honest, most of us are interested in everything because we're scientists, so we're curious about the whole universe. Um, we narrow down some piece of the universe by our talent, um, by our interests by what we can get funded, usually. Um, and then we go off and we pick a small piece of the universe to turn into our research program. That's what we do. We pick a gene or a particular point in Earth's history, um, or maybe, maybe we pick some process. And we go off and study it. But what DCO has shown us is that not all questions can be answered on a single spatial or temporal sc scale, right? There are some questions, like carbon. Can you make an element into a question? I think the Sloan peepers, people are still here, so we'll say yes, an element all by itself without any other words can absolutely be a question. I think we've shown that for the last decade. An element can be a question, but to answer a question like that, you really need to be sort of in a whole different way of thinking about science. You can't have a question like carbon and go write a three-year NSF proposal. That's just not going to do it. You need big groups of people um, that are really different and have, in some ways, never talked to each other before. And you need to put those people together and really just let them go. And so it's that kind of thinking that has made DCO successful. And I think it's shown us that those big sorts of questions can't be answered if you think about a particular time scale. Um, for instance, like just the Hadean or just the Anthropocene. You can't think about just a particular spatial scale, like the planetary spatial scale, or the scale of a single crystal, or even just the molecular scale. This sort of multi-scalar science is something that DCO has shown us can really bring a bunch of people together. And what we get out is science that is actually greater than the sum of its parts. So you might be wondering, I'm supposed to be talking about something else, why I'm so darn philosophical about DCO. Um, and it's because DCO has sort of, I, I kind of blame DCO, thank you, Bob, um, for somehow convincing me that I should go do some big, giant project of my own. Um, for those of you who have ever done this, and I know every, all the speakers who are coming through here today, you all know that big science means big bureaucracy. And that's not really appealing to any of us. I think we're all on board with that. Um, so why might you do this? Well, what we've seen, what you have all shown us for 10 years, um, is that if you put a bunch of really excited people together, and you enable them to do all kinds of crazy science, and you imagine technologies that haven't even been invented yet, it turns out that's not a crazy idea. That might actually be a really good idea, and you might get something out of it that you've never seen before. And so with that as my example, um, I've been working for the last uh, six or seven years now on a slightly different question than just an element. Um, I've been working on actually a very tiny, little, itty-bitty baby question. Um, I don't know if any of you have sort of thought about this before. Um, I have been working on this question, how did life get started? Um, clearly, uh, it's just a tiny little thing. I, I should be done by next week, so just you know, hang on. Maybe by Sunday, so if you're not leaving till then, I'll catch you at Dulles. 
Um, no, this is, this is not a question that is mine alone. Uh, humanity has been asking this question collectively and individually, I think, since humanity started thinking at all. Um, so this is not a question that's new, um, but we're trying in this team to sort of take a new approach to this question. And so I wanna spend the next few minutes telling you about my approach to this question. Um, some of you who study the origin of life, and I know a lot of you do, some of you may have heard that we often argue inside this community whether metabolism came first, or RNA came first, or maybe some other biomolecule came first. Well, I decided, I decided to sort of start my research endeavor with something that I did know. And what I did know is that the Earth came first. So that's where we're starting. It's a very different perspective, um, I think, than a lot of people have taken to trying to understand the origins of life. We're gonna start here with something we kind of know, or at least we try to understand, which is what the early Earth looked like, and we're gonna go forward from there and see what it can give us, because we know it gives us the life that we see on the planet today. So today I'm just gonna walk you through um, our basic science questions, um, a little a bit about the approach we're taking and where we're headed in the future, and then I wanna tell you about some opportunities. So I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of details. Um, we were just recently funded um, by NASA, and so um, we're, we're gonna be doing this for quite some time, um, and I just wanna sort of take you through some of what we've been thinking about. So, in order for me to sort of talk about the science questions we'd like to ask in the Earth First Origins Project, I need to sort of remind you all how folks have generally gone ahead and tried to understand the question of the origin of life. And it's not really a bad approach. Um, what has largely been done is people look at life as we know it right here on the planet. We break that life down into its components. There's DNA, there's RNA, there's metabolisms, there's lipids, there's proteins, there's amino acids. And then we go into the lab and we try and figure out how to make one of those things or maybe two of those things. And we work sometimes for decades trying to find the best way to make one or two of those things. Um, and then you run to your favorite geologist. This is literally what people do. They run to their favorite geologist and say, I have this beaker. Where was that beaker on the early earth? Um, and most favorite geologists will say, I'm sorry but those conditions you have in your beaker uh, really never could have existed on the early Earth. So nice try, but I think you should go back to step one and start all over again. And so what we're doing in this project is we're starting at a different place. We're starting with the early Earth. We're looking at the conditions on the Hadean, we're looking at how they evolved, um, and we're looking at them not just on a planetary scale, but on a very specific individual environment scale. And then we're trying really hard to recreate all of those conditions in the lab. And we're just gonna see what comes out. It's a very agnostic way of doing origins of life research, um, which is anathema to the way most origins of life research is done, but we're just gonna see what comes out because if we can figure out what the early Earth was like and we can replicate those conditions in the lab, the chemistry that comes out of those experiments is the chemistry that led to life, period, that's it. I don't actually have to know in advance what I'm looking for. I just have to know that I got the earth conditions right. Um, and what that makes is what it makes, and we sort of go from there. And so here's sort of what we're looking for. We're gonna start with these early earth conditions. We're gonna move forward, um, hopefully finding some of these components of life as we know it. Um, I doubt that we'll get all the way to making a full cell in the lab. That's not actually what I'm hoping for. Instead, what I'm trying to figure out is how and where did life originate on the Earth? How did the specific planetary processes give rise to particular environments? Not a whole environment like the whole atmosphere or the whole ocean, but particular environments um, and the conditions that enable, that enable the prebiotic chemistry that led to life. And what was the sequencing of environments and chemistries that actually got us down this prebiotic pathway? That's one of the things we're trying to do. And in order to do that, we need to first of all understand what the Hidean Earth looked like, right? Um, the Hidean Earth was different throughout its history, and a lot of different things were changing all at the same time. And we need to figure out what that meant, not just for planetary conditions, but what those sort of changing planetary conditions meant for individual environments. 
How does the changing ocean chemistry impact the chemistry in hydrothermal vent systems, for example? How does the changing atmospheric chemistry impact the fluid chemistry of surface water systems? Those are the sorts of things that we need to do. And then what we need to do is we need to go forward and put them into the lab. And so the real, center, the real centerpiece of this project is the gateway to early Earth. It's this feedback mechanism between understanding early Earth conditions and replicating them in the laboratory. And we've sort of split that up into two pieces. We have the virtual early Earth portal and the early Earth laboratory. In the virtual early Earth portal, this is going to be, this is in conjunction with um, Peter Fox and our colleagues. Um, we're really trying to build a few different things in this portal. It's a virtual place where you can go and say, gee, I have these laboratory conditions. Are they actually valid on early Earth? And you know, the portal will tell you yes, no, or otherwise. Or if you would like to replicate something like a hydrothermal vent um, at 4.4 billion years ago, the early Earth portal will tell you what the chemistry of that might be. And then what we have, I'm sorry, these words are wrong, this, we also have the Early Earth Laboratory. And in the Early Earth Laboratory, this is where we build all of these environments that replicate the Hadean Earth. Um, I put the, all of these pictures up here because um, I have been mentored and, and really had the um, luxury of having Bruce Watson as a colleague for the last six years. And Bruce is sort of a, a yeoman scientist. When he has a question, his answer is always to go into the lab and see and do the experiment. And so that's what we're gonna do. We are going to experiment our way out of this um, through the Early Earth Laboratory. And so what does that mean for all of you? Well, I, um, there are opportunities for the teams across um, the Earth First Origins group, and so all of those teams are here. There's also this new initiative by NASA, the Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments, RCN. If you wanna talk more about that, I will be at the poster session tonight. Um, and then finally, I just wanna tell you about some opportunities at the Rensselaer Astrobiology Research and Education Center. We are made up of a bunch of DCO scientists. There are also some folks who are not here yet. That's because we'll have some faculty openings in the next year or so, so please keep your eyes and ears open for that. And we have lots and lots and lots of space for graduate students to come play in both the virtual Early Earth Portal and the Early Earth Laboratory. So come find me if you wanna talk about that. And with that, I will say thank you because I am out of time. Thank you very much. Are there, are there questions? I'm set free. Wow. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Yes. So, so my background of considering this a meteoritic origin, right? Um, so one thing we do think about is what sorts of um, sort of so what sorts of sources of organic molecules might have been present during the early Earth, right? And so there is certainly room for delivery of organic matter um, to the surface. My, my theory on that has always been that even if it's delivered, it has to survive, and so you really have to understand the environments to which it gets delivered. Um, but I do not think that an elephant rode a meteorite to Earth, no. That's not on the list of things that we're looking at. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.